The religious historian Bart Ehrman has a nice way of framing the earliest history of Christianity by asking his students, how did Christianity go from being the religion taught by Jesus to a religion taught about Jesus? What he means by that didactic question is that based on the earliest writings we have about Jesus, which are found within the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the teachings of Jesus differ quite a bit from the eventual religion that sprung up around him after his death and purported resurrection. To take one example, Jesus, based on the Synoptic Gospels, never called himself the Son of God, never called himself divine, and certainly never said that he was the equal of God. Instead, he taught about the coming apocalypse and how people should live in the remaining time they had in order to be admitted into heaven. We here at Tarnished Archaeology are not going to weigh in on the merits of those shifts, but clearly, just how early Christianity went from being a religion centered on the teachings of a Jewish apocalyptic preacher and the coming end of the world, to a religion entirely constructed around the divinity of Jesus himself and the miracle of his resurrection, is one of the critical ideological innovations in all of world history. Although, in some ways, it is not that unusual. In fact, religious symbols and figures are rarely revered as divine in their own time. Usually many generations pass before the full divine mythology coalesces. Countless Catholic saints have been canonized posthumously, and the traditional biographies of the Prophet Muhammad and Siddhartha Gautama were all written centuries after their respective deaths allowing plenty of time for mythology to develop. And that should not be so surprising. After all, it is easier to mythologize something in its absence than it is to deal with the difficult realities of the flesh and blood. But what if the divine symbol of your religion is not a person, but an object? A tree, for example. In Elden Ring, this pattern of posthumous deification is maintained not only with Merica, who, though undoubtedly worshipped in her own time, has become an even more omnipresent symbol since her imprisonment. Indeed, that is why her most common symbol, seen in the Churches of America, is actually of her imprisoned pose. But so too the Erd Tree, that towering symbol of life-giving power of the Elden Ring, became an object of faith after it was gone the devoutness of its followers only growing in its absence. Here is the story of the first burning of the Erd Tree, and the evolution of faith in the lands between. The first burning of the Erd Tree is a topic we've touched upon before, in our very first video in fact, so it's about time we update some things here. To begin with, multiple items attest to a bygone era of abundance, known as the Erd Tree's Age of Plenty. We'll leave a full discussion of the incantations for later on in the video, so here we'll just mention the blessing of the Erd Tree incantation, which reads, quote, The Erd Tree once flourished with abundance, yet it was only for a fleeting moment. Such is the course of all life, end quote, clearly indicating the ephemeral nature of this Age of Abundance. And the Blessed Dew Talisman tells us, quote, It was once thought that the blessed sap of the Erd Tree would drip from its bows forever, but that age of plenty swiftly came to a close, and with time, the Erd Tree became more an object of faith. End quote. The icon of this age of plenty is the Erd Tree relief, seen on America's bedchamber and the Erd Tree sanctuary, where, if you look closely, you can actually see the blessed sap dripping from the bows of the Erd Tree. But again, the talisman's description makes it clear that that age has long gone. This Age of Plenty was apparently during Godfrey's reign, as the Crimson Amber Medallion reads, quote, The Erd Tree's old sap becomes amber, treasured as the most precious of jewels in the Age of Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. End quote. These days, the Blessed Dew no longer falls from the Erd Tree itself, but rather is collected from the minor Erd Trees. The Flask of Wondrous Physic reads, quote, A relic of the physic chemists, priests of the Erd Tree, harnesses the power of crystal tears which form after the passage of many moons. 
basins are placed at the feet of minor herb trees throughout the lands between. End quote. And finally, the Crimson Seed Talisman tells us that, quote, the herb tree was once perfect and eternal, and thus it was believed that herb tree seeds could not exist. End quote. So, to summarize, there was an age of plenty during the reign of Godfrey, and during which blessed, life-giving sap dripped from the herb tree, which was collected and used in a very specific ritual in Landell. But don't even get us started on that one. This age of plenty swiftly came to a close for some as-of-yet-unstated reason, and during this time of crisis, the herb tree produced seeds, something which was once thought impossible, and now its progeny, the minor herd trees, are the only sap producers left in the lands between, zealously guarded by the avatars that sprung up with them. These guardians, the avatars of the herd tree itself, take the form of a destroyed root stump, symbolism that will not be lost on regular viewers of the channel. And in fact, we do know a bit more about what this crisis actually was as the Golden Seed description tells us that, quote, when the Elden Ring was shattered, these seeds flew from the Erd Tree, scattering across the various lands, as if life itself knew that its end had come, end quote. So evidently, the catastrophe that brought about the end of the Age of Plenty was indeed contemporaneous with the shattering of the Elden Ring, and the Erd Tree's response to this crisis, prematurely producing and scattering its seeds in a time of stress, is indeed what many plants actually do. As pointed out by one of our astute viewers, this process is called bolting and is a common response of plants to stress. They produce seeds prematurely in a desperate attempt to save their lineage, if perhaps not the individual plant itself. All pretty straightforward stuff so far, but we'll need to discuss the burning of the herd tree. The primary forensic evidence for the first burning of the Erd Tree comes from the city of Landale itself. The light of the Erd Tree was once a glorious beacon of light for the lands between, but is now a golden siren song, as the city at its base has fallen into disarray and despair. Soldiers abandon their posts, misbegotten hack soldiers to pieces just outside the rampart gate, the queen's bedchamber is empty, and most conspicuously of all, a thick layer of ash covers the entire city. The ash is such a catastrophe that the residents of both Upper and Lower Lane Dell have taken to sealing their doors and windows with wax. A strategy almost identical to that used in the American Dust Bowl, when residents would use tar paper, if they could afford it, which is basically just paper saturated with tar, the remnants of decaying organic material, to seal their windows and stave off the incessant dust. Landell, to put it simply, is a post-apocalyptic wasteland, but not everyone knows it yet. We've heard some arguments that perhaps this ash is from Grand Sax's decaying corpse or some other source, so let's do a little bit of investigation. First of all, the ash is found throughout the city, in both Upper and Lower Landell, including in points of high elevation, like near America's Bedchamber, or the eastern rampart of the city, very far away from where Grand Sax is. In no way is it concentrated or localized to just where Grand Sax is. It's not like we see a layer of ash in Furumazula or other places with dragons. Instead, we specifically see it covering the city of Landell. Second, in the end of the game, of course, we burn down the Erd Tree and produce another wave of ash, literally transforming the city into a, quote, capital of ash, end quote. So it should be no mystery as to where the ash comes from. And finally, in the Mending Rune cutscenes, we can see that the ash created from our burning still lingers, though we've regenerated the Phantom Erd Tree. 
We'll return to these cutscenes in a bit, but for now, just think about the state of the world after these Mending Rune endings. There is an Erd Tree, yes, because its spectral form, what one of our very astute viewers has called a phantom instead of an illusion, has been regenerated by mending the Elden Ring, but the ash lingers in the capital for all to see. In other words, it's exactly what we find when we enter Landell the very first time, evidence of a prior burning and regeneration. Miyazaki has long been a fan of cycles, fire and dark, hollowing and restoring humanity, the pre-human civilizations of Bloodborne. And here is Elden Ring's core cycle, the burning and regeneration of the Erd Tree. And we, the tarnished of no renown, are by no means the first to do it. For context, breaking the cycle, a deeply Buddhist notion close to Miyazaki's heart, can occur in only one of two ways. Either we don't regenerate the Erd Tree at all, as in Rani's ending, or we so catastrophically burn it that there is nothing left to regenerate, as in the Frenzied Flame ending. Notice also how in the Frenzied Flame ending there is just the physical stump left, basically that which preceded the Erd Tree, the remaining physical portion that remains after the Phantom Erd Tree has been consumed by the Frenzied Flame. So with all that cleared up, what can we say about this first burning? When did it happen? Is it the same thing as the shattering? What were its consequences? To answer these questions, we need to take a look at how Elden Ring tells its story through the timeline of its incantations. That tantalizing line of the Blessed Dew Talisman description indicates that after the Age of Plenty closed, the Erd Tree, rather than being something tangible which offered real benefits, became entirely an object of faith. And the process of transformation of that faith tells a deep and obscure story. If we start with the prayer books themselves, which represent distinct schools, their symbols say quite a bit about this evolution of faith. First, we have the ancient Erd Tree incantations, which include the Crucible incantations. And as we know, the Crucible phase is the beginning of the grafted Erd Tree. What the ancient Erd Tree incantations show in both the prayer book form and the insignia behind the individual incantations is a full-bodied physical tree with the Elden Ring seemingly embedded into it, indeed the grafted source of the Erd Tree's life-giving power. The first of these incantations is Elden Stars, explicitly the oldest Erd Tree incantation, as it refers to the arrival of the Golden Star bearing the Elden Beast, an event which happened long before the Age of the Erd Tree. This ancient Erd Tree set includes the Crucible incantations, as we said, as well as Blessing's Boon and Blessing of the Erd Tree, both of which speak of the Age of Plenty. Interestingly, Malekith's Black Blade also dates to this era, but we'll return to that story later. So, incantations discovered in this era derive from the power of the Crucible, the Erd Tree's grafted initial form, and the Erd Tree's Age of Plenty, when life-giving blessed sap dripped in abundance from its bows. This era of bounty, as we know, was fleeting. Next we have the era of Erd Tree worship, which, paradoxically, is represented by a very different symbol one that de-emphasizes the actual arboreal form of the Erd Tree in favor of its metaphorical representation. Gone are the deep roots and bountiful canopy of the ancient Erd Tree incantations. Instead, there is only the symbolic representation of the Erd Tree, a Celtic cross with the Elden Ring at its center, and of course, surrounded by conspicuously fallen leaves. So how do you get from the Age of Plenty with a bountiful tree to an age of Erd Tree worship in which the tree itself is gone and has been replaced by an object of faith? Well, as we established earlier in this video, that is exactly the transition that occurs after the first burning of the Erd Tree. So with that in mind, let's fill in some of the gaps. 
The ancient Erd Tree era, aka the Age of Plenty, ends with the first burning of the Erd Tree. Likewise, one of the Erd Tree incantations from this era, Wrath of Gold, is said to have been discovered when the Elden Ring was shattered, again linking this new era to a post-shattered world. And if you think about it, the linking of Cycles of Burning to the shattering and reformation of the Elden Ring is not so surprising, when you consider that it's exactly what we do in-game. We burn down the Erd Tree so that we can reform or repair or alter the Elden Ring. These two processes are inextricably linked. And based on Ragier's dialogue, which tells us that the Night of the Black Knives happened during the Golden Age of the Erd Tree, and preceded the Shattering, we can place this event, of course the exact relationship between the Night of the Black Knives and the First Burning are topics we've touched upon previously, and as one of the core mysteries of the game we will return to soon enough. So the First Burning of the Erd Tree ends the Age of Plenty, and begins the Age of Erd Tree Worship, symbolized by the metaphorical Phantom Erd Tree. Members of the faithful began using the Erdtree seal, which is explicitly called formless, and tells us that faith in this formless symbol holds the answers, even though the Elden Ring was shattered. Remember that grace actually controls what you see. Many NPCs react with surprise and envy when they learn that we can still see the guidance of grace, and the Golden Rune description asks us, quote, do you see the Erd Tree towering over there?" End quote. The implication of this question being that some people don't even see the Erd Tree at all. The only reason to ask if we see the gigantic golden tree towering in the distance, which would be an absurd question otherwise, is that not everyone can see it, just like not everyone can see the guidance of grace. Indeed, these days, the Erd Tree is merely an object of faith. Just like in early Christianity, faith in the divinity of its subject only deepened after that subject was long dead. The incantations developed during this time tell the story of war on behalf of the Erd Tree. Not the wars that founded the Empire, like the war against the giants, but the later wars of territorial aggression. Barrier of Gold was used in the Lyurnian Wars, Golden Lightning Fortification was used in the War Against the Dragons after Gransax attacked. Then, according to the Protection of the Erd Tree incantation, through countless victories in war, the Erd Tree became the embodiment of order. In other words, this era closes with the founding of the Golden Order. The founding event of the Golden Order seems to be the removal of the Rune of Death, at least as told to us by Enya. And of course, after this, later on the Golden Order fundamentalists become obsessed with death, death root, and those who live in death. But just like we did for the ancient Erd Tree and Erd Tree Faith eras, let's take a look at the prayer book for more information. The Golden Order Principia, as it is called, is clearly a reference to Isaac Newton's Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, often referred to simply as Principia or Principia if you really want to impress your friends, which is probably the single most famous piece of scientific work ever produced. In it, Newton lays out the equations and principles that guide the fundamental workings of the universe and have tortured high school physics students ever since. The core principles, the fundamentals you might call them, were his universal law of gravitation, the notion that all objects with mass contain an attractive force, and his laws of motion, probably the most famous of which is the dictum, quote, to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction, end quote. Universal gravitation, the attractive force which governs the motions of the heavenly bodies and fallen apples alike, is the cognate to the Golden Order's law of regression. Quote, 
that all things yearn eternally to converge." End quote. Likewise, Newton's laws of motion, specifically the third law, is the cognate to the Golden Order's law of causality, which is, quote, the pull between meanings, that which links all things in a chain of relation, end quote. So the fundamentals of the Golden Order, which describe the laws of the universe, take clear inspiration from these most famous of physical laws. But the story goes much deeper than that. You see, the word causality there tells us quite a bit. The philosophical notion that, to borrow the Golden Order's phrase, all things are linked in a chain of relation, is called determinism, and it basically begins with Newton. Newton's laws were so widely applicable, so perfect in describing the motion of bodies from the sun and the planets to how an arrow flies through the air, that they started a revolution in how people thought about the natural world. A famous thought experiment known as Laplace's demon succinctly sums up the issue. If we can predict all future events of a system by knowing its original state, then if some being were to know everything about the universe right now, the positions and momenta of all particles in the universe, then that being would be able to know the entire history and future of the universe with perfect precision. This thought terrified some, but to Newton, actually this clockwork precision of the universe, that the position of Mars or Venus could be predicted with absolute certainty, was evidence of the power of God, not an argument against him. Hence the quote we cited in the introduction, quote, This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being, end quote. But many wondered, if these laws were so universal, and we could understand cause and effect so perfectly, what about us? Are we just physical bodies whose actions can be perfectly predicted? Was there any room in these laws for free will? So it should be no surprise then that many rejected the notion of determinism based on exactly this issue. And like in Newton's day, the issue of free will was an issue for the Golden Order. How else to interpret Goldmask's conception of perfect order, which he believes corrects the fundamental flaw of the Golden Order? What was that flaw? Well, according to his mending room, quote, the current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed on the fickleness of the gods no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment, end quote. The fickleness of the gods, just like the fickleness of men, lies in the choices they make. Indeed, in the very act of making choices, the one element of the material world that would not be adherent to perfect deterministic order, free will. Goldmass's solution to the vexing issue of free will, likewise drawn from parallels in Renaissance history, is a story for another day. It might seem a bit counterintuitive at first that one of the founding works of modern science is portrayed in Elden Ring as a holy book upon which an entire religion is based. After all, these days faith and science are often seen as antithetical. Take for example Francis Collins, who was seen as a controversial and unique choice to run the U.S. National Institutes of Health because he was also a strong believer in Christianity. But this was not always the case. In Elden Ring and in real history, the dividing lines between faith and science are not so clear. In fact, specifically during the Renaissance, there was a wide effort to incorporate the classical, that is to say Greek and Latin as well as Abbasid Arab, scientific and philosophical principles into current doctrines of faith. This was part of the great project of Renaissance humanism, which spawned great thinkers and artists like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and, of course, Isaac Newton. Newton himself was famously pious, a devout Christian believing that his discovery of laws that permeate all of nature were clear proof of the existence of God, whose commands all of creation follows. Indeed, an entire appendix in Principia is dedicated to precisely this point. 
One of the consequences of the Renaissance, the Christian Renaissance specifically, was the merging of the classical natural and moral philosophies with Christian doctrine. In Elden Ring, this merging effort is represented by the will of one man, Radagon. Radagon is a Renaissance man, through and through. The pose of his statues is taken straight from da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, a classic example of Renaissance art and da Vinci's conception of the perfectly proportioned man. Just like the Renaissance humanists, Radagon attempted to merge the classics with religious doctrine. His icon tells us, quote, As the husband of Renala of Caria, the red-haired Radagon studied sorcery, and as the husband of Queen Marica, he studied incantations. Thus did he aspire to be complete, end quote. And the Golden Order incantations require both faith and intelligence to master. Like the Renaissance thinkers who rediscovered the old texts of Plato, Plutarch, Aristotle, Al-Kindi, and the rest, Radagon studied the ancient scrolls of the Academy of Raya Lucaria and merged these principles with faith in the Erd Tree and the Elden Ring, thereby spawning the Golden Order. As Muriel says, heresy is but a contrivance. All things can be conjoined. So we have an Age of Plenty era defined by the ancient Erd Tree incantations and represented by a dominant, fully corporeal Erd Tree with its bountiful canopy. Godfrey is Elden Lord in this era, and the Erd Tree is a real tree which blesses the faithful with its life giving sap. Then the Erd Tree burns. And so the Age of Erdtree worship is represented by the Phantom Erdtree, the metaphorical representation of the Elden Ring's power. But what is the representation of the Golden Order? Once again, if we look at the incantations in the prayer book, much is revealed. Gone is even the symbolic representation of the Erdtree. All that is left is the Elden Ring and the triangle which has been added to bind it. The triangle and ring visual again being suspiciously similar to the Vitruvian man, whose legs were so well proportioned that they form an equilateral triangle. This triangle is of course also quite evocative of the symbols of the Holy Trinity, the Christian Orthodox answer to the question, how could Jesus be both fully a man and fully a god? Much like Koran's question, the Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true God. However, the name of Marika's second husband, King Consort Radigan, also appeared. Who exactly was Radigan? Goldmask struggles to rectify the dual nature of Marika and Radigan in the same way that early Christians struggled to rectify Jesus' dual nature. And in both cases, the answer is much less based on logic than it is faith. Think that Radigan was Marika herself, or at least such is all I can interpret from the rhythm and calculus of his finger. How would such a thing even have been possible, I wonder? Sadly, I cannot comprehend it myself. The Erdtree was corporeal in the Age of Plenty and a phantom in the Erdtree Faith Era. So what happens to it during the Golden Order era? To answer that, we will need to take a look at Radagon's symbol, seen best on his sword seal and on the Elden Ring itself. His symbol is a trellis, a structure used to support climbing plants. That's right, boys and girls, it's time for another Tarnished Botany lesson. Trellises are latticed structures used to support the growth of climbing plants like shrubs or vines. An odd choice for a symbol, for sure, until one realizes that vines have actually completely taken over Dell in its current state. As we've pointed out many times, the physical ur tree itself is just a stump at this point, with a golden phantom in its place. But that's not to say there isn't any new growth. In fact, Giant, invasive vines have overtaken the Erdtree Sanctuary and its surroundings. You know they're vines and not roots because, well, they visually match. 
they aren't contaminated with death root the way that the roots are. They exhibit characteristic climbing patterns, which are not seen in roots because roots are gravitropic. They grow down. Only vines invade buildings and take such torturous paths, growing sideways and upwards like this, in search of supporting structures. Exactly, by the way, what trellises provide. We can also clearly delineate them based on their braided nature, similar to woody grapevines. An easy way to tell them apart from the actual Erd tree roots. Let's not forget, too, that thorny vines are what have blocked off the entrance to the base of the Erd tree and access to the Elden Ring. It's no coincidence that when we defeat Malaketh and unleash the Rune of Death, not only do we burn the thorny vines that block access to the Elden Ring, but we burn the giant vines in the sanctuary too. Both are burned by the Flame of Ruin, and both are absent in the Capital of Ash and the Mending Rune cutscenes. They're both gone because they were both part of the same growth, and that growth is the source of Radagon's power. Radagon is no grafter, he's no arborist, and neither is he a zealot for the power of the Erd Tree. But he is a zealot in defense of the Elden Ring. After all, he is the one who attempted to repair it after America shattered it. So it seems that Radagon, when confronted with the catastrophe of America's betrayal, her shattering of the Elden Ring, came up with a solution. To repair the Elden Ring as best he could, and then harness the power of invasive vines to protect and shield the Elden Ring from any future malfeasance. That is why vines are seen in his statues and his icon, and the golden trellis, his symbol, is shown supporting the growth of the thorns that block our path unmistakable evidence of his plan. It is only by burning the whole thing down, thorny vines included, that we are able to access the Elden Ring and challenge him. The age of the ancient Erd tree begins as shown in the crucible statues, pruned to foster the golden lineage of the Erd tree, and reaching its age of plenty. The age of Erd tree faith begins with the Erd tree felled and the Elden Ring shattered. This age is dominated by an illusory phantom Erdtree, symboled by the Celtic cross on its sigil, and by America's statues where a giant concealing veil hides the truth. Like early Christians only deepening their faith in the divinity of Jesus after his resurrection, Erdtree faith is strengthened in response to the catastrophe of the burning of the Erdtree. Then, the Golden Order begins as death is removed from the Elden Ring, and the sickly Erd tree stump begins crown sprouting in a second crucible era. This is symbolized in Radagon's statues where he stands on the crucible without tending to it. Instead, he puts up a trellis to foster vine growth around the untended stump. In this age's apogee, defensive vines protect the Erd tree stump that still contains the Elden Ring. There is much more to talk about as we populate these eras defined by the evolution of faith in the lands between. When we continue this story, we'll discuss the heresies of the later stages in Landale's history, and with that, it may finally be time to talk about the fingers. Fingers.